gentlemen. Uh, welcome again, once again. Thank you for turning out. This is, whew, this is about, we are looking at getting another venue, I must admit. So hopefully soon we'll have a larger, somewhat more comfortable. McCurdy Pavilion. McCurdy Pavilion, yeah. That's, that might be a little too big. Just a touch too big. Um, tonight's uh, subject is money. To wit, I want to show you on the back, which I think is appropriate, because if, do people know what a Kickstarter is? It's a crowdfunding program where people sort of kick in to support something. In this case, if you're interested, I'm, I'm kickstartering a book and a book related to some classes. Um, if you're interested, just go to either the address there, Kickstarter Project, blah, 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 or if you just Google Kickstarter West Cecil, the project will come up. Because I'm something of a Luddite, I mistimed it completely, so there's only like five days left. So <laughs> this is my marketing genius right there. So if you're interested, you're going to want to check tomorrow or the next day or the day after that, because that's about it. Monday at some point, it wraps up. So uh, yeah, that was brilliant on my part. So yeah, if you're interested, I would greatly appreciate it. We're about halfway there now, so we'll see. It'll be interesting to see what the response is. All right, so. Tonight's subject, money. Um, can't even imagine what to say about it. <laughs> I'm not going to do a lot of time arguing that um, Americans are interested in money. <laughs> I think this is uh, notorious and, and moderately self-evident. I will look a little later on um, what this means, how it's structured, and what influence that it has that we're so deeply and passionately in love with all things related to money. And that, in some ways, it is uniquely American, but mostly an emphasis. Money has been around for a while. It's been popular the entire time. Um, <laughs> I am going to do, this is such a large subject that I'm going to do two nights on it. So this is money one, and the next night will be money two. And I decided to do this because we so comprehensively misunderstand the nature of money that I thought it would be good to sort of start with a historical background, some analysis of what money actually is and how it works, and then start moving into things about our peculiarities surrounding it. So I'll get to some of that tonight, but a lot of this will be historical and background, and then we'll move forward in the next one and look at some of the more uniquely American elements of money. So tonight, money one is sort of money, what the hell is it? Um, I think the quote from Shakespeare there uh, it says it all. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. This is famous speech from Prospero in The Tempest, one of uh, Shakespeare's most wonderful and magical plays. Money is one of the most human creations imaginable. It takes all of the elements that make us uniquely human and combined into one thing. Hence, it completely baffles us. It baffles us because nothing baffles a human being like a human being, right? This is everything. People always talk about, you know, you know, math is hard or physics are hard. No, humans are hard, right? They're just baffling and wonderful and great. But but it, but it did just it's difficult to get our hands on exactly what it is we're up to. Um, the second quote there is from the King James Bible. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So we've chosen mammon um, <laughs> for the record. Given that choice, we went, yeah, mammon. Uh, so in spades. So let's start talking about mammon and money. Uh, first thing to note, money goes back in recorded history, some of the first things we have are money, but it looks like, and this is speculative because it's not recorded history, it's archaeological history, that uh, in the Neolithic age, this is before 10,000 BCE, uh, the, the obsidian, which is spread all over the Neolithic world, but obsidian generally occurs in very few places around the world. I mean, it's all over the place, but it's usually in isolated locations in Europe and the British Isles and Africa, right? It's not... It's not evenly spread across the surface of the earth. And each cache of obsidian has a peculiar chemical uh, trait. It has different sorts of minerals in it. So we can tell pretty accurately where any given piece of obsidian comes from. And essentially, every Neolithic community you find has obsidian in it, often large caches of obsidian. So we know for certain 
that there were extensive hundred, even thousand mile trade routes so that the uh, Indians west of the Cascades here, uh, Native Americans in Washington, had obsidian that, obsidian that came from eastern Washington. So you think, you know, this is, that's a long ways to walk. Um, and so they were shipping obsidian across the Cascades, across the Olympics, up to Nia Bay, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The ubiquity of obsidian, the fact that it's found just about everywhere in the Neolithic world, the extensive range that it covers, and the fact that we find it in caches that make no sense for use value, suggests rather strongly that it was probably functioning at least partly, and at least part of the time, as money. That people weren't trading, and they weren't going, oh, I'm going to trade you a, a sheep for some bowheads that I can you know, spear some wildebeests with, or whatever your economy is. They were going, oh, well, this will be worth something when I walk over the mountains and get there, because whatever they have, which I don't know what it may be, they'll want obsidian for it, because it has that sort of monetary function. Um, Fast forward if you go from there, so, but that is speculative, right? Because we don't have that written down. So you got, I have to be careful there. But it looks highly suggestive that already, as soon as you get Neolithic man, as soon as you get any evidence of, of the spread of human culture, well, there they've already got money. Maybe we'll dig up a credit card someday. But at least they've got <laughs> this, this obsidian trade routes going all over the world, wherever you get Neolithic man. Fast forward a couple of thousand years, seven, eight thousand years, to when we get writing. Some of the earliest writing is cuneiform writing. And cuneiform writing uh, is spread pretty broadly because the empires associated with it were spread pretty broadly across the ancient Near East. And this is about 3000 BCE or so. And what you get a lot of, not exclusively, but what you get a lot of are these little seals and little tiny, they're about the size, smaller than the palm of your hand often. And they say things like, two days ration of beer. And for the longest time, they, they couldn't figure out exactly what these were because they were so widely spread. And now it looks pretty clearly that what these were, were draft notes that you could call basically, in theory, you could go to the central authority, either uh, the temple or the mayor of the local town, I don't think they had mayors, but the equivalent of a mayor of a local town, and draw on the resources there. But again, the ubiquity of these seals, are thousands of them, and the fact that they're distributed so widely suggests, naturally enough, that what people started to do is say, oh, I could get two days' worth of beer for my workmen, or I could trade it to you for, you know, two of your wives. Um, you know, that, that this, this, you know, that, that, that it, became, it began to circulate just like money. Um, so and we'll return to this, this timeline in a second, but I just wanted to just let you know. So we're talking about the earliest evidence we have from Neolithic culture. We know they had massive trade routes, suggest the very strong possibility of money. The earliest written documents we have are already functioning clearly as money. So this, it's, it's extraordinarily human. As soon as we get any kind of civilization and we start getting trade, as soon as we get trade, it looks like we invent money over and over and over again. We're always inventing money. The feds are always having to step in to stomp out people who have started their own currency. We'll see why they have to do it because it's so easy, so wonderful, and so necessary. But what is this stuff anyway? The one way to think about it is money is just a tool. It's like a hammer. We're going to come back to this hammer analogy over and over again. If you want to do something, if you want to drive nails or pry a board, you want a hammer. This doesn't confuse us at all. But what money does, it has this great sort of threefold at least function. And that makes it a little more confusing because it doesn't do one thing. It does three things and it does them kind of simultaneously. One is it makes exchange easy. It ameliorates exchange. So that if you see their main function of money, medium of exchange. So before you get the widespread of acceptance, and this has happened all over the world, there's even places today where this is true, you have to try and calculate, how do you trade things? If, I'm a, if I milk cows and I have a bunch of milk and I want shoes, how much milk, you know, how do I make that exchange? Maybe you don't want milk. 
Maybe you want sheep, so then I have to trade the milk for the sheep so I can take the sheep to the guy who makes the sheep. And you can see as soon as humans start to diversify and specialize, it becomes impossible to work this out. Or not impossible, just extraordinarily difficult. Much easier to just have something that's universally accepted. So first, it's a medium of exchange. Everybody will accept it for just about everything. And that makes trade much easier. I mean, vastly, vastly easier. Because you don't have to try and you know, make all these connections across 72 different articles to actually get something that the person who has what you actually want, wants. They can work that out for themselves. It shifts the, it shifts the responsibility of working that deal out onto the other person. I know what I want. They know what they want. Why do we have to even talk about that? We can just trade this. Second, and obviously closely related, is it's an, a, 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 a measure of value. It gives you one thing that you can measure the value against. So again, if I have milk and you have shoes, not only do I not have to go get somebody with a sheep, now I can just, we can just agree, oh, milk is worth $5 a gallon. Great, shoes are worth $20. So... I can just say, hey, here's $20. I know I have to find somebody who wants milk, and I have to sell four gallons of it. We measure everything against one, in theory, one. Never works out quite that neatly. But we have one medium to determine the value of just about everything. Again, this is hugely efficient. Um, there's a, uh, like the 1550s or 1600s, one of the economists did a, a study, and he said right around, I believe it was Hamburg, if you were going to trade, there were like 112 units of measure, 16 different currencies, totally different tax structures, and all kinds of laws and limitations and toll. And so you couldn't hardly figure out, to be a merchant was to try and keep track of all this, made it virtually <coughs> impossible. Nobody knew what anything was worth, or it was very difficult, because there wasn't one medium, there were 16 or 17. They didn't agree on costs of exchange. They didn't agree on anything. This is one of the things that really brought the economy down in the Middle Ages is these toll roads and barriers to trade, one of the barriers being no one had an agreed currency. County to county to county to county to county. In five, ten miles, you might have 20, literally 20 or 30 different currencies exchanging at different rates. And this is before you had like automated traders, you know, being able to track it all with computers. It's just people going, I don't know what, what your currency is worth versus this guy. How am I supposed to know? And so, and so traders, merchants who did travel around, would carry, you know, 20, 30 different currencies and then some gold and some silver and some wine and whatever they thought people would take. Again, hugely inefficient. Um, finally, money is a great way to store wealth, to store value for future for, for what's coming. For us, this just seems, of course, you know, you just put it in a bank. Well, before you have money, what do you put in the bank? So again, if I milk cows and I get a bunch of milk, how do I store that for the future? Answer, I can't. It's not storable. If I have grain, it's perishable. It stores a little longer, but it's perishable. Virtually everything that was produced agriculturally particularly in an age before refrigeration, is perishable. And so you're like, yay, I got a bumper harvest. Great. What the hell do I do with it? <laughs> right? I, I could put it in a storehouse, but what, the hell, what do I want with 10 metric tons of rye? I have no use for 10 metric tons of rye. So I want a way to take all this theoretical wealth I've made and convert it into a type of wealth that doesn't get eaten by rats, doesn't rot, doesn't curdle, doesn't get stolen by my neighbors so easily. And so money, money does all these things. And so we invent it over and over and over again. The, 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 the estimate that writing has been invented maybe three or four times in history. Money gets invented daily. I mean, literally, it's always being recreated. Um, we'll get around to the notion of Bitcoin, one of our new forms of money that's been created. So on one hand, this is all great and all perfectly natural. It's like a hammer. We want to trade things, we want to know their value, and we want to be able to store our wealth. And we have an object, a tool, to do that. Money. Perfectly functional. What's baffling about money, and what we're going to look at a lot, is think about what this means, though. 
One, it's a symbol. Right? This is man, the symbol using animal. So we've created a symbol. It has no inherent value. Look at the list of things that have been used on money. It's on the second page. And this is a brief list of objects used as money. Called commodity money, by the way. Peppercorns, large stones, shells, hide, slaves, tobacco, salt, beads, feather, coffee, barley, blanket, tea, metal bars, animal teeth, alcohol, cigarettes, cannabis, and decorated belts. That's a brief list. This could go on and on and on and on. Anything can be used as money as long as we agree that it has the symbolic power that we want it to have. So first, it is a symbol. It has no inherent worth. It has a symbolic value. This is one of the first weird things about it. Because we want it to have real value in the world. We'll talk about this. It does not. It's always symbolic value. Second, you have to be able to imagine to use money. If you don't have an imagination, money is worthless to you. Because you don't want money. We don't want money. People don't, I mean, we say we want money, we don't mean we want money. We want the things we think money can buy. It's always this abstraction, one removed. I have a symbol that will allow me to acquire something from my imagination. See how strange that is? <laughs> right? It, it, if you don't imagine that you can exchange a cuneiform stamped object for whatever it is you want, some rice, some milk, some food, an arrow, something, you don't think, oh, that's great. That's a lovely piece of clay. <laughs> if you don't understand its symbolic worth, you're like, why is this guy trying to give me a little piece of clay? I don't want a little piece of clay. <laughs> Don't give it to me. And this happens all the time. We have a lot of records in history where, you know, if you showed up in ancient North America and said, look, here, I'll give you $50 for that beaver pelt, they'd be like, what? Unless they thought it was cool looking. Now, oh, that's kind of cool looking stuff. No, they, they were like, oh, I want paper. I want something cool. Beads, glass, mirrors. They love mirrors. In fact, it turns out that much of the beaver trade up here in North America, northern North America, wasn't really done with gold and silver because it turned out that the natives weren't all that interested in gold and silver. They were interested in all kinds of products from Europe, but not really the quote-unquote money. It had no intrinsic value to them because it's just a symbol. It has symbolic value. So first you have a symbol that you have to recognize and then you have to tie that with something in your imagination. And then that imagination has to be cast into the future. Because generally there's this time lag. You know, it's a store of future value. I have to think, oh, I can take my money into the future and get the thing that I imagine exists there and is going to make me really happy then. Totally human. All these are human capacities. In fact, all these are pretty much uniquely human capacities. But it's bizarre. And the final part that really makes it just wonderful and strange is it only works if we all agree. It's Peter Pan, <laughs> right? Everybody, we all fly together. The second people stop accepting money is the second it stops working. If you don't accept money, then it doesn't work. It's a, it's a social consensus. The value of money is a product of a social consensus. But the reason money works and has always worked and is continually reinvented is because it serves such a strong purpose once you have a society. It's so hugely functional, like a hammer, that we want it. We need it to work. Because otherwise, we're stuck in this horrible, unbelievably complex system of barter that we can, it just doesn't work, and so we never do it. We just immediately create a new kind of money, over, again, over and over and over again throughout history. And so a lot of our misconceptions about money come from not understanding that it's simply an imaginary, symbolic action that you do within a society that all agree on the nature and value of those actions. Nothing else. So um, if you look on the back of the flyer there, you have this example. It's called a ray stone. These are in Micronesia. This is money. This is cash money. This is big time cash money. 
right? Forget the 50 cent piece or the silver dollar. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is some cash. Pocket change. Uh, pocket change if you have large pockets, yes. <laughs> Several tons worth of stone. Now, this stone was carved someplace else, not generally where they're deposited. Then they're put into rafts or canoes. So think about putting this into a Micronesian <laughs> canoe, right? Several tons of awkwardly shaped rock. And then you have to paddle it or sail it to wherever you're going to deposit. Then you have to get your friends to drag that son of a bitch up to someplace <laughs> and stand it upright. And all of that story is what determines its value. If you're a famous sailor who had a lot of friends and everybody knows that was Bob's Rock, that's the value because it's so obviously huge. And so if there's some political dispute, some boat, something of huge value that needs to be traded, some war that we want to stop, some big marriage that we want to work out, you would go to where these stones are lined up and say, I tell you what, I own Bob's Rock. Instead of fighting a war, I'll give you Bob's Rock. All right, that's worth a Bob's Rock. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll take it. Done. Sold. So now everybody knows you own Bob's Rock. Well, hey, that is pretty damn, sh you know, that's nice. That's a good deal. Or maybe you got ripped off. <laughs> you only got a Bob's Rock for that? <laughs> you should have got something else, too. You know, and so they're all lined up usually in one place. I mean, there's more than one place where these are. But they tend to be collections in one place. And then people would gather and swap them. For goods, services, political arrangements, and marriage. <coughs> See, and, and for us, this is like bizarre, right? Because you go, well, how can that be money? But notice, symbolic value, in this case, quite literally stories. Oral agreement. Everybody stands around and says, this has value, so it has value. If suddenly the Micronesians went, you know what? That's just a big damn rock in the middle of no place. And people go, well, so much for that cash. Right? The, the market would crash. We've all seen this, right? <laughs> you know, it's not like we aren't familiar with market crashes. They work the same way, regardless of what kind of cash you're talking about. Um, and so this is a type of cash. Now, one of the big mistakes that we make is to think that commodity money, as they call it, actually has value. This just throws us off because we think of coins as old money as being gold and silver. Now, this is often the case but not, not generally the case historically. Again, I made that list, brief list. All kinds of things have been used as money. And what tricks us is we think that gold and silver have some kind of <coughs> inherent value. But they don't. Why do we think gold is valuable? Because other people think it's valuable. In societies that don't value gold, gold has no value. And they wouldn't use it generally as a, a means of of monetary exchange. Um, in the uh, 16th, 15th century, 16th century, silver from the New World floods Spain. And this contributed to part of what was called the price revolution. There's a couple of things going on in Europe. They had some tin and silver mines in Germany going pretty strong. You get this new stuff from the New World. They got some credit cards. Essentially, they invented the, the line of credit, which sort of, of course, expands your economy rapidly. And this massive inflation. Uh, prices went up, I think, like five times in 60 years. I mean, it was a huge. Prices have been very flat. Well, what massive inflation means is that the price, the value of silver plummeted. What used to buy, what you could get for one silver coin 20 years ago now took four or five silver coins. See, there's no intrinsic value in silver. The silver doesn't mean, has, it, you know, it varies by hugely. Gold, if you've, anybody's followed the gold market recently, low, high, now it's plummeting again. Gold doesn't have intrinsic value. But we like to imagine it has. And all your early monetary theories, the physiocrats, the mercantilists, physiocrats said land is where value is. Mercantilists said gold, silver, currency is where, what has value. We're always trying to put the value of money into something tangible. Because we like tangible things, right? Because 
We are also animals. We're in the world. We like things we can manipulate, put our fingers on, massage. We can go, ha ha, I can feel it. It has value. But the other side of the human, I said the part that baffles us, is sim the use of symbols is hugely, incredibly powerful. We know this. Our social cohesion is hugely, incredibly powerful. It allows us to build pyramids, to build freeways, to put men on the moon. Telecommunication, social cohesion, it's an unbelievably powerful historical force. That's really what backs any currency. But we don't like to believe that. In fact, we don't like to believe it so much that in the current Republican Party platform, this is what I'm quoting from here, Reagan established a commission to consider the feasibility of metallic bases for the U.S. currency. Read gold standard. The commission advised against such a move. The commission advised against such a move because it would be suicide. That would be the <laughs> end of the U.S. economy. It was like the dumbest idea ever. Um, so now, three decades later, as we face the task of cleaning up the wreckage of the current administration's policy, we propose a similar commission to investigate a possible way to set a fixed value to the dollar. And that commission will come back and say, that is a bad idea, just like the previous commission did. But notice this obsession. This is the official Republican Party platform. But we love this idea because it's so human to say there must be something palpable, something we can touch and feel that backs our currency. And if you don't have it, what they call it is fiat money, meaning, well, you just make it up out of thin air. But you don't make it up out of thin air. Try it. Write out some cash and take it to a grocery store and say, here's some fiat money. And they will say, no, thank you. We accept a wide range of credit cards. Um, they won't take it because what fiat money means is just not backed by anything you can kick. It is backed by the full faith and power of the U.S. government. By the way, we have a really super incredibly powerful government. We have unbelievably strong social cohesion and the world's largest military. Ha ha. <laughs> Translated, our money is really valuable. It's really valuable not because it's backed by gold or silver, but it's backed by the largest fleet of naval vessels the world has ever seen. The biggest air force, lots of nuclear missiles, hugely advanced technology, and a pretty damn vibrant economy. That's what makes our money valuable. And social cohesion. If we had a civil war, our, the value of the dollar would plummet. I mean, absolutely tank overnight. We don't look like we're on the verge of a civil war. In fact, we look like we're the least on the verge of a civil war of any country in the world, which is why everybody puts their money here. Um, periodically, over the last couple of years, the US has looked like such the best place in the world that people have been paying us to take their money. Because we're paying less interest to borrow their money than the inflation rate which means in real terms, they're paying us a little bit every year just to keep their money safe here in American dollars. That's really, really good money. That means our money is as good as any money has ever been. And it's either backed by nothing, no gold, no silver, no anything, or backed by the history of the United States, our military, economic power, the quality of our people the justice of our laws, the strengths of our communities, the richness of our ecological environment and the resources we can harvest from it, the ones that we pass down to the future. And that is ever so much more valuable than all the gold and silver in the world, which is why we can print trillions of dollars worth of cash and not suffer massive inflation. Contrary to even today, many economists' expectations. Like, how much money can you print? Turns out, a hell of a lot. I mean, a really shockingly large amount of money. And still going strong. I don't know, it's odd. It's hard, unbelievable. But if you look at the history of money, you can see this quite clearly. So if we move forward from the cuneiform receipts. 
that we were talking about. By the way, if you read the Code of Hammurabi, basically the earliest law codes that we have, there's all kinds of rules in there about the kind of interest you can charge, how you have to handle contracts for bank drafts. I mean, half of it is if you do this, we cut your arm off. If you do that, we cut your head off. If we do that, we brand you, right? Sort of the old-fashioned laws. And the other half is kind of all these banking regulations. <laughs> Which shows that, that right from the get-go, right, as soon as you get civilization, you sort of want to cut people's hands off and you want to make sure they don't write bad checks, right? It's a sort of, I don't know, it's kind of right, the first thing we want to do. Um, the first minted coins, you know, sort of with a stamp of somebody's face or with a god, often, usually a ruler face on one side, god on the other side, which is to say, this human and that god say this piece of metal has lots of value. And you should believe it. Those come up about 700 to 600 BCE, all over this ancient Greece area, right? And the Egyptian, all in that area, they, they start to crop up. It seems to occur to them, hey, we'll just stamp a face on it. And voila, it's money. It has actual value. And it turns out that it works. I mean, this is the crazy thing. You put the face on and people, ooh, backed by God. We still have that, right? In God we trust. <laughs> You know, 2,000, whatever, 600 years later, we haven't come up with anything better. What should we put on it? Ooh, in God we trust. Oh, that's a great one. Minerva, no. Zeus, no. <laughs> Mazda, no, no, no. Marduk, no. And they went a long time. And they just said, we'll just go with generic God. Right? They should have a little bracket S, right? God, zzz, in God, zzz, we trust. Uh, yeah, no, they didn't do that. So, so we start getting minted coins there. And ever since then, the minted coin thing has really taken off. People are like, ooh, that is a great idea. Let's mint our own. In fact, let's cut this silver down about 50% with tin and mint them. In fact, let's cut it down about 90% with tin or, or copper or t anything that we can get that's cheap. And, you know, and then, of course, you get all kinds of currency crashes. And everything that we think of today as being all modern and new started happening back then. Um, seventh century, you get early banknotes in China. The reason banknotes are earliest in China is because they invented paper. And apparently the next day you go, oh, paper. You go, oh, paper currency, that's just awesome. <laughs> right? Rulers are like, it's like, boom. They're like, we know what to do with that. Get all that hard metal, because that stuff's expensive and hard to deal with, and just give them paper. But how do you get people to accept paper? See, this is tricky, because they're like, ooh, I used to get something tangible and concrete. And that seems so reassuring to the sort of animal monkey side of us. This pure symbol stuff, this... Writing on, literally writing on a piece of paper, says, hey, look, this has a lot of value. Believe me, look, here, right here it says it has value. Come on. Um, the way you do that is you threaten people. Uh, <laughs> this is always, the flip side is God loves it and we would hate to have to run you through with a spear. Uh, and so this struggle is sort of what makes money go. Um, we don't have any of the early banknotes, unfortunately, haven't survived, but we do know in the 13th century, Kublai Khan probably had the first widespread use of paper currency. And he was very successful with it because he was a very aggressive killer of people who disagreed with him. <laughs> and so if you were a merchant, you had to accept the currency or he would kill you. Um, and he was efficient, and so this made the currency work. And European visit Marco Polo famously wrote about this, if we can trust his work, which I think maybe we can, maybe not, but probably historically accurate. He was amazed. And he says, they just take these pieces of paper that these scribes write on, they put a seal of wax on them, and everybody treats it as if it has value. It just blew his mind. like, well, it's just a piece of paper. What are you people doing? And I don't know how they explained it to him, but probably something like, if you don't take it, we kill you. Oh. <laughs> but once you agree, right, this is the social agreement. Once you agree, it works fine. And as long as you agree, it works fine. As soon as we stop agreeing, it doesn't work. So as long as Kublai Khan was around, as long as everything was moving kind of smoothly, big internal market, obviously, China, so you didn't have to, external trade, of course, is going to be ha ha have to happen differently. But internally, you could regulate this. And so it's very successful, ran for quite a while. Um, we don't get this in Europe until this, about the 1660s, in part because we didn't get paper until very late in Europe, um, and in part because of the sort of factionalized nature of it. But in early, they say that the earliest uh, money was in Swedish banks, um, issued in the 1660s, 1664 or so. And about a year later, 
They had wildly overissued the currency and they had a bank collapse and the government had to step in and rescue the bank. And I like to think, there it is. All of financial history has just played out in like three years in the 1660s, right? We issued too much currency, the government has to step in, taxpayers, well, there you go, right? We know this story. We, we, you may be familiar with this. It just happens over and over. Um, another big date then, but so as you, this, all this has been going on for a long time. This is not new. This is not modern. This is not different. Some aspects feel different, uh, but it's not. In 1971, the world sort of semi-officially just converted to fiat money. We'd been on fiat money for a long time, but finally the Nixon administration said, you know what, that's it. Let's just stop messing around and let's go for it, right? And everyone thought, oh, well, that just works fine. <laughs> right? This is like, oh. So for the last 40 years or so, nothing has backed anything, more or less. We trade currencies all the time. It's huge. Trillions of dollars change hand weekly on the currency markets. If you want to know the value of your currency, it's reassessed moment by moment, 24 hours a day, all over the world. <coughs> Floating currencies, they float against each other. If things start to go downhill in the United States, ooh, our currency gets weak, other currencies get stronger, they go up and down, everybody always being reevaluated, reassessed. But against <coughs> other currencies, not against anything in particular, against other floating currencies. So we have all these groups of agreed, consensual, symbolic issuance of money that we compare with other agreed, symbolic issuances of money. And we say, well, your symbol issuance is now worth less than our symbol issuance. And on it goes, right? And so we trade those back and forth. Now, this has real world effects, of course. But notice it always comes back to this is a symbolic agreement of a community backed by sort of our lives, the stories we tell, our imaginations, and our willingness to imagine a future in which we can take that money, which we do not want, and trade it for things we do want that will make us happy. And so those are the main functions of money. And it seems simple enough in one hand, but also, again, very strange, because it's not appealing to just have it floating out there. We don't tend to think of our capacity to imagine and the capacity to use symbols as being powerful, but they are. That's what's driving us. That's what's going on. And then just to drive this point home, in 2009, bitcoins were launched. This is a digital currency that is generated by solving algorithms. So the value of the money is proportional to sort of computer power versus difficulty of equation solution. You can think of it as that. This is sort of a math bath backed. Why is it valuable? Because it's backed by mathematics. And because people want it and will exchange it. One Bitcoin today is going for roughly $500. Um, there's a lot of Bitcoins in circulation, but they tend to be used for shady purposes. So we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. So this, you can take it to the you know, sort of extreme level and say, you know, this is, how do you make Bitcoin? Any of you can mine, they call it mining, I love that. It's an old term, Notice we can't escape that idea. How do you get Bitcoins? You mine them. But you don't dig them up in your backyard, you set your computers to digging to solve these equations. You have to get sort of the lowest possible uh, solution. Um, and then you can, you hit a hoard of Bitcoins and then you put them into circulation. You mint your own Bitcoins. It's crazy, but it's wonderful. <coughs> Because it works as long as other people accept Bitcoins. And right now they're accepting with the raise about $500 per. It's crazy, but true, right? I couldn't make that up. Um, so on one hand, you have this notion of money. And it's been popular and it's been around. And so now it's ubiquitous in our world. One of the things that throws us off, though, is we've never been able to look at it like a hammer. So I have this over 200 verses in the Bible and at least 40, it's a lot more than that, in the Quran on money and wealth. And as I say, not many on hammers. Because <laughs> the Bible and the Quran are not suspicious of hammers. <laughs> Thou shalt not loan a hammer to thy neighbor. <laughs> your children shall not touch the hammer of your uncle's cousin. See, it doesn't say any of that. Unless it's in very remote, obscure passages. No, but it talks a whole bunch about money. 
because it freaks us out and has been freaking us out since its inception. How does it work? I mean, it really, on one hand, people are like, powerful, huge, weird. So think of our obsessions with usury. So if I loan you some money and you pay me interest, you have to give me more money back. So I become richer without doing anything. And in the ancient world, this just looked like black magic. That is not right. To become rich or richer or wealthier without labor, without any physical material thing happening, that no, that just, that just was wrong. And so you've got usury laws and regulations on usury from, like I said, Code of Hammurabi. From, you know, as soon as we get money in circulation and draft notes in circulation, we get things like, oh, you can't do that. Which shows, that, one, that people have been borrowing money at exorbitant and ridiculous rates since they invented it. Other people have been profiting on it since they invented it. And governments have been stepping in to try and stop it since they invented it. So this is, you know, this is nothing is new under the sun, as they say. But we're so used to it, we lose track that in the ancient world, it was truly miraculous. <coughs> Part of this is... Our economy, even though it's sluggish these days, is growing one, two, three, four, five percent a year. In the ancient world, it's hard to estimate these things, but they said generally you would have centuries, whole runs, where your economy was essentially flat, no increase. So people always say, why were there so many wars, so much land grabbing, so much exploitation expansion in the ancient world? <coughs> If you wanted to get richer, the only way to get richer was to take what somebody else had. It looked to them like a zero-sum sum game. There, you didn't, you know, there just wasn't any other way to go. If my neighbor gets richer, it's because he probably took some land someplace or made a great marriage. The problem is, is, is if you had a really good crop year and you're like, jackpot, my wheat produced more than ever. I'm going to be richer, at least. If you're a landowner, of course, peasants and slaves don't count. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, what happens when you have a boom harvest of wheat in the ancient world? Price goes down because probably everybody else had a boom harvest of wheat. And in the years when everybody's crops fails and the price shoots up, well, nobody has any wheat. Right? So even when you had price fluctuations, they tended not to generate you know, wealth. And so it, it, you know, we have great records, particularly from ancient Rome, and they were absolutely obsessed with land. It was the only thing they were basically interested in, being famous and owning land. Because land meant wealth, not money. I mean, money circulated in ancient Rome. They had a lot of it. They traded. <coughs> money was, was sort of completely tertiary. It was land, land, land to slaves. Because you needed slaves to work the land. And what this exposes is that for us, we've lived in the money economy our entire lives. For most of history, most of mankind have not lived in the money economy. Money has been around, but if you were a peasant or a slave, you didn't have money. You had obligations and rights. You get to farm this corner of land, and you have to split 50-50 with the person who owns it. And the person who owns it has to give back to you grazing rights, uh, water, um, four changes of clothes a year, and uh, the, the right to use two slaves. The, almost the entire ancient world was regulated by these sorts of relationships. Legally binding contracts that said, you're a serf, you can't leave the land, you have to stay here and work. But in exchange, you get food, clothing, and the right to use this swampy corner to plant whatever you want, which isn't going to grow anyway, so you starve to death. Um, but, you know, that sort of, this, these were the arrangements. There was a little bit of social mobility. People could move up, things could move down. But mostly it was warfare, conquering, being conquered that redistributed wealth, but it tended, A, not only not to make new wealth, it tended to destroy wealth. Because, you know, conquering cities, not good for them. Burning down crops, not good for them. Killing a bunch of slaves, not good for them. Right. And so, what we take so for granted in the world, this is one of the first myths of money, it's completely altered our view of history. 
We look back at history and we say, oh, they must have been motivated to make money too. They're like us. It turns out that even the rest of the world today is not necessarily as much like us as we are. And certainly anything before you know, Adam Smith in the 1600s or so, um, most of the population had essentially had no contact with money. Often it was illegal for them to have money. As strange as that is to say. If you think like a, a country like Sparta, they were anti-money. The ancient Lacedaemonians, they were just like, look, you do not want money. You can own property. Actually, your wife basically owned it because you were always in the barracks. But any money that's owned was communally held. Individually, even the rulers, in theory, had no money. It's an early sort of proto-communism. Ancient Greek world, you had freedmen who worked on the land, probably had little or no access to money. You had slaves. They don't count at all. You had women, who don't count, <laughs> right? So amongst your citizens, they even often had limited amounts to do with money. And there's all kinds of restrictions on what you could buy, how much you could spend. Um, and a lot of your money was converted into religious symbols. It was basically just given to the city because that's what you did with money. In fact, the, the early rewriting of the codes of ancient Greece was because they had developed sort of the cash lending economy. And the aristocracy worked out that they could loan money to freedmen who would then blow it, and then they could take those freedmen and sell them into slavery and make money doing it. <coughs> and so a whole bunch of the population of ancient Athens, I know you love capitalism, a whole bunch of the population of ancient Athens was so indebted or had become slaves, freedmen becoming slaves, that it looked like there was going to be a revolution. Right? Between people who wanted the debts forgiven and the land redistributed from the aristocracy, and the aristocracy who's like, man, we've almost got them all in slavery. This is great. Right? The ultimate, we've really consolidated power. And so a lot of these early negotiations that give rise to proto democracy in ancient Greece was trying to solve this problem. And they said, one thing is you can't do these loans, you cannot put yourself up as collateral for loans. That's what was not, they made that illegal. You couldn't borrow against your own self. I, I, I just wonder if we could make that legal again, what would happen, <laughs> right? I mean, if you get the Visa card offer in the mail, you seem awfully healthy. <laughs> you know, we feel like they're borrowing against our lives because it's sort of this calculation they do against how much money we're likely to earn, how much debt we have, all this. But it's not really, right? It would, otherwise, Visa would have like these big slave markets. And they'd go, oh, you know, come and buy this person. Uh, but, but this, they had, they, they, lived, they had to outlaw that. You couldn't, you couldn't loan against yourself. By the way, this is one of the reasons the ancient world was suspicious about lending for interest, because it created all these problems for them. And again, it kept creating money out of nothing, which totally freaked them out. It still sort of freaks us out. Again, look at the Republican thing. They're like, you can't just keep generating debt. People have heard this, right? The American government can't just keep generating debt. Well, yes and no. <laughs> So far we can. <laughs> and it will work right up until the time it stops working. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's the magic of it, right? We're not sure when that is, and nobody knows. But right now it looks like we're really, really safe. There doesn't seem to be any problem, but then that probably means the market will crash tomorrow and we won't be able to print any more debt. Uh, but that seems unlikely. Um, historically, it suggests that governments actually never really go bankrupt. That the day that they go bankrupt, the next day people are lined up to loan to them. Oh, those people got screwed. Well, this is, I'm first in line now, so here we go. Let's start up. Uh, so that's, that's, it's great. But we, see, we are still suspicious. You can't just make money out of nothing. Again, yes and no. So we, first, do not let it distort your view of history. People in history were not like us in this sense. Most of them had no access to money. In fact, most of them had no access to what we would call improving their station in life. Everyone was busy trying to maintain their station in life, preventing their particular legal protections from being eroded and their obligations from being increased, <coughs> none of which generally had much or anything to do with money. And so this throws off our historical perspective completely. Again, not that money wasn't important. 
I mean, money was important, but most people had little or nothing to do with it because they were outside the, the sort of paying economy. Another thing I want you to um, think about, let's see, did I put that on here? No, okay, so the second part of the ancient world that throws us off is, again, we think about this growth of, of access to goods, that we had all these markets where people are trading and amazing things are going on. That existed in an extraordinarily tiny segment of the society. Uh, estimates put that in ancient Rome, which had excellent transport roads, by the way, if you were shifting something overland, it doubled in price roughly every 40 miles. So if you wanted to transport lumber from you know, the forests of Germania to Rome, but no, you couldn't do it. The shit would be more expensive than gold by the time it got there. You could, I mean, it just was practically undoable. If you wanted to ship rye or wheat 120 miles, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars now, you, you got a five or six time fold increase. That's why Rome was fed, fed across the Mediterranean from one coast to another. Huge specially built docks to bring it almost the entire way by sea because you could not move things by land. Well, you could, but only small, light, and extraordinarily valuable things could be moved by land. And so this is why the ancient world was looked at the oceans, looked at the seas, looked at the rivers, because it was the only way to move things. And so we look out at a commodity-rich world, and we think, wow, look at all this diverse goods. This is not what the ancient world saw. They did not see a commodity-rich world, almost no one. And so even if you had money, there wasn't necessarily a lot to buy. It's the ancient, not ancient, it's the joke they used to make about the Soviet Union. Oh, everybody has money, but there's just nothing to buy, right? You'd be on like a five-year waiting list to get a refrigerator that probably didn't work. It's not because you didn't have money, you had all the money, well, you know, money, but you just, what, what, what are you going to buy with it? You get to line up to buy bread. That's what the, very much more like what the ancient world, except for to the ancient world, Soviet Russia would have been a paradise of consumer goods. They would have thought, well, this is the richest place ever. Look at all of this. But to us, we're like, oh, no, no, no. We've got Amazon, <laughs> right? All the goods of the world. We can, or anything you can imagine, delivered to your doorstep. And so one of our confusions with money is it totally distorts our view of how the world used to be. And this is important to keep in mind because, you know, the, the, the nature of human society is variable and changeable. Ours is extraordinarily unique in, in at least this element, if, if there are several others, I think, but this is one. In the last 400 years, 300 years, we've entered on a completely new economic station. People talk about the new world order, the new banking. People are nervous about it. We have all these financial collapses over and over again. One reason we do is because it is brand new. We do live in a new world. We've never really had an open world spanning, free trade, free flowing currency market before. We've never had the capacity to efficiently move goods around the world to the, to the extent that, literally, you guys have probably all done it. You can go online and order something from China and three or four days later, it sits on your doorstep. Think about that. I mean, this, if you go back and look at like the letters of George Washington, he had an agent in London. Because all the consumer goods that they wanted in the New World, they couldn't get. But they had them in London. And they had them in Paris, but mostly he's dealing with London. So he would write letters to his agents in London. OK, that takes a couple weeks to get there. And he'd say, buy this, 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 and this for me. Well, a lot of times those things weren't readily available even in London. So it would take them a couple of months to get it all together, and then they would have to ship it back to the New World. So that takes a couple of weeks, and then it's got to travel overland, or up the river, in Washington's case, to wherever he was. Um, 
And then he would unload it and go, no, that's not what I wanted. That's too small. That's too small. That's why it's a wrong color entirely. It makes me look fat, you know? This is horrible. See, and, and for, so, so here's the here Washington, one of the richest guys in the New World, certainly one of the most powerful, one of the best connected on the Eastern Seaboard with good water communication to the Atlantic Ocean, which had great water communication to the you know manufacturing hub of the universe, London. And it would take him months to years. Literally, it took him over a year to get some of the things he ordered, and they showed up wrong or busted. And I always wondered if he just sends the receipt back, right? We have a return, get your money back guarantee policy. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't really, it turns out. Um, and so this, right, that was the world even 200 years ago. That, that's, it's almost unimaginable to us that even if you were the wealthiest guy with the most connection and the best resources and water routes, a year, two years, to get even some of the most basic things. I mean, he was, a lot of this wasn't crazy stuff he was ordering. It was, he wanted a mantelpiece. He couldn't find anybody in the New World to make one, so he ordered one from England. He wanted a carriage. He wanted a fancy carriage, let's face it. He, you know, he basically wanted the, the Ferrari of carriages. So he couldn't get that in the New World. So, you know, a couple of years later, this carriage shows up. And he's like, oh, he really said, this is a crappy carriage. It doesn't fit right. It's, the gilding is terrible. You know, it's all wrong. And that is if you're, again, the wealthiest guy with all the money you could, you could pretty much want. But he, even Washington, read his letters, he was mostly interested in land and slaves because <clears throat> that's where money was. Wealth was land and slaves, not cash. Cash had all kinds of problems in the old world. People still weren't comfortable in dealing with it. Uh, it's hilarious to have the ledgers when mercantilism really starts taking off, we think, oh, bookkeeping, straightforward, easy, no, but no. When European trade, trade picks up in the late 1600s, early 1700s, one, they still didn't like to use zero. Not widely accepted, the use of, I still don't know how you keep ledgers without a zero, but they didn't like to use it. The sums are almost invariably wrong. Long division, nobody could do. If you did long division, they'd burn you at the stake. <laughs> wow. That guy is a witch. Burn him. You know, because they just, they really hadn't mastered it. You know, the, any sort of record. And it seems to us like, of course, that must be the most natural thing. No. It's a completely new way of looking at the world. And this is where I want to end up for this time, because it leads into where we get totally misled is the aspects of money, the s s imagination, the use of the symbol, the necessity of, a, of looking into the future, the more you take on a money economy, the more those aspects of the human experience, the human mind, the human outlook come to dominate. You become more interested in abstractions. You become more interested and invested in, in imaginary constructions. The ancient world was land, 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 land. I can feel it. I can roll around it. I can put a potato in it. Slaves, slaves, slaves. Physical human beings like me. They can do things. I can, I can understand that. But this dedication that we have now to this abstraction, this ab abstract world of symbols and desires and imagination, this is new, at least to the extreme that we carry it our willingness to forego the immediate, the now, the physical, for the obscure, the, again, the abstract, the non-tangible, the symbolic. Think about, I think there's a couple of examples. Uh, one, if you look at the art world, they call it a provenance. It's the history of paintings or sculptures or whatnot that really gives them the value, the provenance, the story that goes with it. So a lovely painting that you have, that everybody knows is kind of old and maybe rarish, but they're not sure who did it. Maybe it's worth a few thousand dollars. If they do an x-ray scan and determine that it's a Gauguin, ho ho. This happens all the time. All of a sudden they go, oh, that's not just a nice looking painting. That's a Renoir, that's a Cezanne, that's a, you know, whoever, you know, a Degas, whatever, you know. And all of a sudden it's worth millions or tens of millions or a hundred million because the story has changed, the provenance is new. Our willingness to invest in that 
as a society, the willingness to believe the story, the abstraction, the social valuation, is, is pretty unique. I've always wanted to run a couple of experiments in the ancient world of going up to some peasant in the field and saying, you know, this particular plot of land used to belong to Nero. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay. <laughs> now it's really valuable. They're like, not particularly more or less. It, had, it would have no impact on them. They probably wouldn't know who Nero was. They don't have the historical knowledge. They're not used to thinking in symbols. They're not used to really thinking in abstractions. Notice what a struggle it still is for us. Like I said, we mine bitcoins <coughs> because the, we understand the concrete nature of mining. We really don't understand machines running algorithms. Let's face it. It's, we, we want the mining part of it. I think that's why people like gold and silver because they can mine it. They imagine oh, you dig a hole and there's some gold and that's great. Not really how mining works, but let's let sort of go with it. <laughs> But printers making money, that just doesn't seem right. And now electronic money, right? The electronic transferring of money, doesn't it seem a little weird, right? I, do, I used to like getting a check from work. And then they went to electronic deposit, and like, it's okay, but a check is better somehow. <laughs> because it's a letter to me from my employers that says, here, have some numbers on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, that's concrete. <laughs> that's not that abstract digits just flying around in computers. But now we're getting used to that, right? I mean, even now we're just like, oh, that's fine. Plastic money, you know? This. And, and so this move to abstraction colors not just our relationship with money, as fraught and crazy and bizarre as that is, as we will see, but our entire outlook on the world to the point where we tend to often distrust our own physical palpable judgments, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Because you know, we like the symbolism, we like the stories, we like the abstraction, we believe in the abstraction. My, my favorite example of this, and I really run this experiment yourself, because um, people will hate you, but it's fun. Um, <laughs> You've all had this, I'm sure. You go to somebody's house, lovely house or whatever, and they, you know, oh, you see this table? Oh, yeah, it's a lovely table. Oh, yes. Do you know what this table is worth? You know what you tell them? What you sell it for. Because that's how we determine value. And they're like, no, 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 no. This, this table is worth because I found out that it's one of these things and it's, it's worth, you know, and I, no, no. You'll only know what it's worth when you sell it, because that's how we determine value. Anybody seen like antique road shows? That's still on TV. <laughs> yeah, they have all kinds of shows like that. And the person there who knows, the person who tells the story, who has the authority to imprint value, it's the exact same thing, it's fiat money, says to somebody who has brought in grandmother's vase, and they say, well, grandmother left this vase to me, I've loved it, it's been our family, it's an heirloom. And if the person looks at it and says, yeah, they made five million of these, it's worth a dollar. They're crushed. <laughs> oh. What? It's the exact same vase, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, but it's not. Because they had told a story. They had invested it somehow with this, because grandma had the eyes, she had taste. Maybe, maybe her relatives used to be, I don't know, kings of Ireland or something. You know, these tales that we... But if they go, ooh, this vase is worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, they're like, oh, yay! I always knew this vase was valuable. And the strange thing is, they can now probably convert that vase into a hundred thousand dollars. Vase? Wow! Why? Because the story has changed. The narrative they've told themselves. But also remember, we do not want $100,000. We have no use for it. We're not interested in money. This is one of the things that throws us off completely. Because people are always saying, oh, you know, you know, I want money, I need money. No, we don't want it. We have no interest in it. Um, my favorite version of this is, I don't want to outlive my money. This is, A, it's not true. When people say this, you just say, you're lying. <laughs> I know plenty of people who've gone bankrupt and seem perfectly happy and don't want to die. 
Like, oh, went bankrupt, there you go. These are called entrepreneurs. They do it over and over and over again. <laughs> they often look giddily happy. They're like, oh, yeah, I went bankrupt, that's fine, we'll just do another business, that's great. They don't look like they want to die. Right? But, we, but for right, she knows it, that's a total confusion of the imaginary. We, we imagine the, what money can do for us. That's what we want. Oh, if I, if I have money, then, then, you know, magic dreams, wonderful things. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about this more, ooh, more next time. We're out of time. Right? Uh, but but it's, it's not the money we want. In theory, it's, it's everything else. It's all the other stuff. And I'll, I'll leave you with this final thought. Because remember, money is a hammer. That's where we'll start next time. It's good for what it's good for. And it's not good for things that it's not good for. <laughs> this seems reasonable. It is not. You will see. This is not true. This is not how we look at it. But think about this. If you had a friend and he said, I want to build a fence. Can I borrow your hammer? I'd say, sure. And I said, do you have a hammer? Yeah, I've got a hammer. That makes sense. Maybe you've got two guys working. And he said, and then you see him driving up his driveway with a truck filled with hammers. You'd be like, why are you getting more hammers? Ooh, hammers. Hammers. Hammers build fences. <laughs> and then you saw the next day with another truckload of hammers, like, okay, what in the hell is wrong with this person? <laughs> One hammer is good for building a fence. Two hammers, perhaps good. Three, if you've got a lot of people helping you, but you don't really need many more than that. But with money, no, we know that's not true. We want a billion hammers. Because the infinite fence of our mind goes on and on and on. So there you go, money part one. <laughs>